Father, we enter your word with prayer. So that the word is not a dark hall, but a lit chamber. For your word says that it's a light and a lamp. Bless us, God. We want to know more about your word and how we can apply it to our lives and how it will change our lives, not for story's sake, not for entertainment value, God, but to know you're doing a deep work in our lives and none of us, not a one, has got it together. You who are making us whole each and every day, we give you, literally, as we say, we're like little birds chirping now with our mouths open because your word says, if my people will open their mouths wide, I would fill them. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with your word and do whatever you want to do in our lives. Whether we think it's good or bad, whether we like it or not, God, I personally submit my life to you for anything you want to do. Amen. Now, there's a lot of background that we have to go over so that you understand fully the, the, the complete God magic of chapter 2 of the book of Ruth because it's crazy what goes on here. Remembering it's a true story, remembering that it shows a picture of our Savior, of the plan of salvation. As a matter of fact, Hebrew texts before the canon was finalized, for you guys to understand that, the book of Ruth was actually with the prophets because it is more a prophetic book than anything else. Again, we talked last week about how this not only is one of the most charming little books of the Bible, but it's also still studied today in secular schools as one of the most beautiful love stories ever. Verse 1, chapter 2, There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. Please stop there, give me your attention. Let me explain to you about the Levite marriage. There is a Levite marriage, not Levi, but Levite. According to scripture in the book of Leviticus, if you have a wife and you die before she has kids, your brother can step up as the Levite husband to say, I, the next of kin, could stand up again, according to scripture, I will make a child, I will marry this woman and carry my brother's bloodline on. It's called the Levite marriage. Now it was something that was completely optional. You did not have to do it. You did have to be the next of kin. Of course, if you were married, it didn't disqualify you, but it certainly made it hard. But what would happen, let's, for hypothetical saying, I have a brother, he dies, he has a wife. I am the next of kin, and I have to go to the gate of the elders, and I say to the elders at the gate, I don't want to marry this woman. And they say, how come? I don't want to marry this woman. And they say, how come? I don't want to marry this woman. Well, the penalty for not marrying your dead brother's wife was they would remove your shoe and the woman would go and spit in your face. And you'd have to walk around that rest of that day without a shoe and everybody would look at you and go, there's the guy that had his shoe removed. And it would be a great shame. Look it up. I'm not making that up. Some of you guys are like, is that really in the Bible? It is. Where is it? You find it yourself. Because I don't remember. Now, why they mention him here is like a part of the charm of the book. And what happens is sometimes you, you read this part, you read this first verse, and you're like, well, of course the next verse makes all the sense in the world, but it doesn't. Watch what happens. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, go my daughter. Again, give me your attention. I told you there's going to be a lot of background. Remember, this is a Moabitess woman living now in the territory of Israel. Now, they're also, remember, this was the time of the judges, and the morality, that would almost be like, let's say, 
you are a black woman and you're in East Boca amongst the very wealthy and you happen to be from a totally different area than most of the other people and you say to your mother-in-law I'm going to go look for a job at town center, I don't know, let me think of a good one, Meisner Park or something. And now, as a black woman, you're walking around this very white neighborhood. And you know how some people are still carrying stuff, especially the, you know what I'm saying, right? No offense, none taken? No offense? Thank you. This is what you have. This Moabitess woman in an Israeli time, but not just danger of being snobberied, danger of being raped, of danger of being absconded, of, of danger of be, I mean, she says to her mother-in-law, proving what we learned about her last week, that she is, this woman is something super special. I'm gonna go glean in the fields. Now, again, what does that mean? Slave labor is as such, at the time, we talked about slavery in the Old Testament times, and it's nothing like what people say, oh, the Bible believed in slavery, that's why people don't, listen to me. Yes, the Bible believed in slavery, but slaves were set free after a certain amount of time. Yes, the Bible believed in slavery for those who couldn't take care of themselves, the name of which was slave. Nothing like what we did in slavery in this country. Nothing like what they did in slavery in other countries. Nothing. Slaves in biblical times were treated well. Over and over again, God said, don't you dare treat your slaves like that. For whatever reason, their life has spiraled to that point that you get to take them on. Now, somebody was poor, and they weren't even good enough yet to be a slave. According to the book of Leviticus, when you went through your fields, remember we're dealing with an agricultural time now. Your fields were growing. Now, this was the barley harvest, and they would walk through picking barley. It was made a law in Israel as such when they walk through, they could only walk through once. The reapers would walk through the barley fields and pick what's there, but they were commanded not to glean. They would pick what had grown once. Over the next few days, some smaller stalks would grow. That was commanded by Levitical law. Leave it there for the poor and the stranger and the hungry and the slaves. Now, again, tough time in Israel, and it wasn't like everybody was buddy-buddy, even amongst the slaves. You know, there's no honor among thieves, the old saying. So for her to say, I will go glean in the fields, like a single Moabitess woman going to glean in the fields in Israel, do out of your mind, you're going to get killed. Somebody's going to kill you or kidnap you or worse. Do you understand? You're understanding the background now, right? So this Moabitess woman, she does. She goes into the field to glean heads of grain after whom in whose sight I might find favor. Whoever will let me. I'll go from field to field to field until somebody lets me glean. Because as we learned last week, Naomi, she's destitute. She's got nothing. Her husband, remember they moved for 10 years, who, who you guys that weren't here last week, the story of Ruth. Elimelech and his wife and two sons, they go about 70 miles away where there's food because there was a bad famine. After 10 years, Elimelech, her husband, dies. Her two sons also die. And she only has her and her two daughters-in-law. One of her daughter-in-law stays in the, in the neighborhood she grew up in. This woman, Ruth, follows her mother-in-law 70 miles back to Israel, but she comes back to nothing. She comes back to nothing. And she says, I'm going to go get us food. Honorable woman. Then she left and went and gleaned in the fields after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, this is what I was talking about. Now, because we mentioned Boaz first, we seem to think, okay, so she went in Boaz's field. No, no, no. Do you see the word happened? You could circle it and write next to it, coincidence. But then you could cross it out because the Jews have a saying, coincidence is not kosher. There is no such thing as coincidence. In all the nation of Israel, in the whole city, in the town that she's in, she happened by accident to go into the town of Haredi. 
kinsman redeemer. What's the kinsman redeemer? That's the Levite who could rescue her, who could marry her, who could raise up children, who could, who could turn Mara. Remember Naomi said, don't call me Naomi, which meant pleasant, but call me Mara because I have went away full, but come back empty. Now I am Mara, otherwise known as bitter. You understand? But remember we looked at the similitudes of God, how this is such an... There's no other word for it. It's such an organic picture of the Savior. Boaz is a type of the Lord Jesus. He is our kinsman redeemer. Ruth is a type of Israel. Bitter and old and worn away with God. And Ruth is a picture of the church. Such a beautiful picture. Matter of fact, even the original names where Naomi, remember, it means pleasant, and yet all through Scripture, Israel is called the pleasant land. Keeping the background as we go, she happened to come into the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the family of Elimelech. Now, stop there again. Go back to verse 1. You see it says that Boaz was a man of great wealth. That word in Hebrew for wealth doesn't mean just riches. It's an all-encompassing word meaning power, um, military might, and honor. Many of the same words we describe our Savior as. So, he was a military man with great honor who also had great wealth. You're about to see, in a time of dryness, Israel again was the time of the judges, the lowest point morality-wise than anything else. Wait till you see what kind of guy this is. Now, listen, for you single brothers and sisters here, this should be a perfect picture for you. You don't have to go looking. It'll happen by coincidence. And who but a living and loving God? What does He want from you? Does He want, well, she's not really a believer. I mean, she's Catholic. Her family goes to a Catholic church, you know, but she has no problem going to church with me. That's the kind of person you want to be married to? No. My brothers. You want to be married to a person whose first line is, she loves Jesus more than she loves you. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. Who else came from Bethlehem? Surprise! And said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Now again, just a little hint onto the kind of personality, the kind of constitution, the kind of morality this man was. In a time where Israel, we looked at, this is the sixth, this is, some scholars will suggest, because of the time frames that it falls, that this is about the sixth chapter, this is happening about the sixth chapter of, of the book of Judges. You guys remember what was happening? Look it back up. People weren't walking out saying, the Lord bless you. The man was a leader. He was, ready, the Lord of the harvest. Who else is the Lord of the harvest? Well, you just said he was the Lord of harvest. He's there during harvest. He is the Lord of the field, the Lord of the harvest. Again, showing the similitudes, the pictures of how this thing is laid out. It's so prophetic. It's so beautiful. Lord bless you, verse 5. Then Boaz said to his servants, because he was the Lord, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Kind of giving a lowdown. He's like, Who's the woman? Who? What's a woman doing reaping in the, gleaning in the field? She's got some kind of hoods, but his girl. That's, um, that's that Naomi's daughter-in-law. You, you know, you, you heard about her. Her husband died, and she came back with her. Mold by this woman came to Israel. We let her glean. Uh, she, uh, just to tell you the truth, boss, I mean, we let her sit in the house just for a little while because she's been working all day, just trying to pick what she can. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. 
Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. So he says to her, immediately he looks at her and he says, listen to me, don't go anywhere else. And here's the, the thought here. You must be really stupid. You gotta be careful. You can't just be going around gleaning. Stay here, okay? Follow my young women. As they reap, you pick up what they, what they miss. Don't go in another field. That's dangerous. That's, don't you know? Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Now, I think that's a great prayer of salvation, if you ask me. And since she is a type of the church, a picture, a similitude, isn't that what we go, we say, listen, I know you're the God of the Jews, but why would you? I, I mean, I don't know if, if this is all hit y'all. But you guys that have Christian parents, you have this thing that's built in because you grew up in this way that, well, my mother's a Christian, my father's a Christian. Listen to me. God has no grandchildren. And there's more sons of Christians that go to hell than not. You've got to find your relationship with God. You have to get to that point to look at like David. Do you, you remember Mephibosheth? Remember Mephibosheth, the guy with the lame feet, who David said, listen, let this guy eat at my, my table. And, and he looked at him and said, why should you look on such a dead dog as I? It's one of my favorite lines. And I say that to God all the time. I was talking to Junior. Remember we prayed for Junior last week and his prayers were answered in the way he asked God to have them answered. And we praise God for that. But the right response is, why? I've used this as an example how many times? It's the exact same thing that happened to Peter when he took the Lord out on the water. And the Lord said to him, you guys might not have been here, but I, I love it because it's my heart. It's totally my heart. Hey, uh, can you take me out on your boat, he says to the Lord. And Peter looks at him and goes, perhaps you don't understand. <laughs> you fish during the night or the early morning. By the time the sun's up, fish are gone. So the Lord's like, well, patronize me. I mean, the Lord. The Lord. And now he could look and go, uh, excuse me, I made the fish. I know where they are. And if I want them to swim around and jump in your net, I can make them do that too. No, he doesn't do that. He goes, basically, patronize me. He goes out on the boat. He preaches the message. Now it's midday. He says, let your net down for a catch. And Peter, you could hear the, the snottiness in his voice. <laughs> yeah, that's what we'll do. Sure, let him down. So full with the nets they were breaking, he had to call his partners. Remember the story? And they pulled the water, and, and more fish than could fit in the boat, the boat sinking. And then some things happen, and you don't think about it. But then Peter is sitting down, and the Lord walks up to him. <laughs> just please just leave me so blown away at the blessing so knowing how undeserved he is so much fallen upon us what why should you take notice now the literal translation in the in the Hebrew is why should you take notice of the unnoticed why would you even look at me? What? This is us. This is the right attitude toward God. Why? Why? It's not a matter if you're going through a trial. Of course you're going to go through a trial. The world's a sucky place. It's a matter that God promises to reach into your trial and pull you out. And you go, why are you pulling me out of my trial? I deserve this. I made this mess. And I'm here to help you clean it up, he says. And you're like, what? Well, you warned me not to do it. I did it anyway. I made a big freaking mess of my life. And you're going to clean it up too? That's what I do, he says. 
And then you wonder, Peter's just like, please, don't even look at me. That's, what a picture, man. Verse 11, Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Lord Jesus said, so let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Sounds so harsh. Sounds tough, man. He really said that to somebody? Here it is, right here in Old Testament. You've left your mother and father. You could have stayed with them. And you've come under the refuge of the Almighty God's wings. And how could I but not be his hands and his feet. I heard what you did. You guys, you got, it's worth repeating. Go back to chapter 1, verse 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. Lord, do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And the angels, awestruck, whose eyes search to and fro across the whole earth, looking for a loyal heart so that he could show himself strong on behalf of. And here's a loyal, my God! He looked at her and said, look at this. One person, one statement with the right heart. She wasn't perfect, nor was David. But David said, he's got a heart after me. And we can say, what are you talking about? He did this, he did this, he did this. You look at the outward. I look at the heart. This was... Incredible. So much so that it was a picture of us. And a picture of salvation to me, making Christ your Savior as well as your Lord. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. Let nothing separate it. Don't make me... Where can I go from your presence? Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, David said. Exact same words. All servants of the Lord who loved him have said that. Do anything. Don't take your spirit from me. Then she said, verse 13, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and passed parched grain to her. Now that word for passed right there, it means literally that he fed her. He literally fed her. This, listen to me. This is a Moabitess woman. Jews called them unclean. They were instructed specifically according to the word, stay away from the Moabites. They are wicked and foul, filthy people. What a picture. Same thing with us. Why the Jews can't wrap their head around the fact that the Gentiles have now been grafted in to their Savior. Why they cannot accept Christ Jesus. They are what the Bible calls, the, the Hebrew word is goy, what they call goyim. You don't go with a goyim. A goyim, you have to marry a goyim, you have to be with a goyim. The Jews can't, 
Listen, my mother's Jewish. I understand these things. You don't eat with Goy. And yet he married us to the Jews' stumbling block. He passed her the grain, and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. You see, on her all the way. She ate, and she wrapped some up in the town. Just, what are you doing with that? I'm, I'm full. I'm okay now. And she just took what was left over, she put it away. Why do you think? For her mother-in-law. Ha, <laughs> not I got this. Not. No. And Boaz is watching the whole time. Um, kept some back. Verse 15. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Also let grain fall from the bundles purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. Basically, the fix is in. <laughs> Whoops! <coughs> So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. An ephah of barley beat out, meaning she already um, uh, thrashed it or threshed it. Was barley comes on the stalk. She'd rub it, rub it, rub it. And then the, the grains would come out. And then you'd throw it in the air. And the, the uh, chaff, the wind would blow the chaff. And then what was edible was left in the grain. And, she'd, and she had an ephah, which according to um, measurements is about nine gallons. Think about a gallon jar. She, she, she got about nine gallons, which was enough to feed her and her mother for close to a week. Then she, verse 18, shook it out and went into the city, and her and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, so she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where the heck did you get nine gallons? <laughs> You're like a magician, lady. No, she didn't say that. She said, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told the mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Listen to me, please. His name was Boaz. Naomi went, You got to be kidding me. Wait a second. In all the fields you went in, and it all came rushing to her all at once. Listen to me, guys. I don't know where you're at. You're in a trial. You're in a place of such... I got to tell you this story. I got to tell you how God is able to reach in. Now, if you've been going to this church for any length of time, you've heard this story, and I'm sorry, you know, my daughter's always giving me crap because, oh, I heard all your stories. Listen to me. <laughs> I'm in prison. I'm there about three or four months. And I used to call my wife morning, noon, and night. In the morning, I'd call her up. How's it going? Have a good day. All right, boom. Our, our phone bill, my father-in-law, how much were the phone bills back then, Papa? Six, seven hundred dollars? Just crazy. But I wasn't going to stop calling. My wife says, Ashlyn wants to talk to you. How, how old was Ashlyn at the time? Six? Five? Now, I was one of those overindulging fathers, and the kids had to go to bed, and, and I'd say, my wife would say, go to bed, go to sleep. She says, I'm the mean one during the day, she's the mean one at night. <laughs> night, they want to, I just couldn't leave them. So she would say to me, Daddy, will you lay down for me? Oh, yeah, okay, I'll lay down with you, no problem. Just a couple minutes. Just a couple minutes, she used to say. Just a couple minutes. Okay. I'd lay down, wait till I'd fall asleep. Sometimes I'd fall asleep, and I'd get up and I'd tiptoe out the room. And that became our thing. That's exactly, she melted my heart. Just a couple minutes. Just a couple minutes. Well, I'm there about three or four months, and I'm talking to my wife, and Ash wants to say goodnight. So I pick the phone and say, Oh, hi, Daddy. How are you doing? How's school? We, we told her I was in, in, in Yale, not jail. <laughs> sounded like it, you know what I mean? School. 
tell a five-year-old you're in prison. It's not smart. <laughs> How's dad? He's in prison. <laughs> what happens? She says, Dad, I want you to come home. I don't like this school no more. I said, well, I really can't, baby. You know what I mean? She said, just a couple minutes. Just like, I've never said no to a couple minutes. Now my heart is just like, you know, dagger. Boom. And she keeps saying, and my wife, I don't know what she was doing, but she wasn't picking the phone up. <laughs> Finally, she picks the phone. She says, honey, I'm sorry. I had no she was like, it's all right. I'll call you in the morning, hang up the phone, go back to my bunk, scream and cry in my pillow so that nobody else hears me, and I go, God, how do, what do you, what, there's no hope, there's, no, there's nothing that can be done here. You can't fill a child, it, there's, it, listen to me, God cannot bring me home, do you understand that? I'm in prison of my own vice, and I know it. I made this mess in my life. And this is Naomi. She's bitter. She's Mara because God has dealt her a bad hand. And some would say it was of her own vices. Some would say, some scholars say, they shouldn't have gone to the land of Moab. They shouldn't have left. Some scholars suggest that they did this to themselves. Nobody told them to go there, to Moab. Next morning, you know, you suck your tears up and you get up and you do your thing, waiting for the days to go by. You know, you count your days. I call my wife and she says, Ashley wants to talk to you. I'm like, I, I don't really want to talk to her right now. Give me, give me a, no, no, you got to talk to Ashley. Good morning, baby. Hi, Daddy. I had a dream last night. God told me you were right next to me, and it was just like you were there. It was so great having you home for a couple minutes. And she starts praising God. Thank you, God, for my daddy being home. I'm just like, this, you see how you feel right now? That's exactly what happened to Naomi. She heard Boaz, like, like in, the, in the Lord of the Rings, hope is kindled. Hope is kindled, man, like the beacon of Rohan is lit. <sighs> Boaz, you got to be kidding me. All of a sudden, the whole plan starts to make sense, and Naomi's like, oh my goodness, is God doing this? Where you are? Now, I don't know what, what side. I mean, I, I know Julia's going through some stuff. I know some of you all are going through some stuff. Listen, it's not too hard for God. Bobby, it's not too hard. And he can do it like that. Like that. Boaz. Oh, my. You got to be kidding me. She heard the name, and look, look what happens. Then Naomi, verse 20, said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. Now, I want you to look at verse 20 in chapter 1. Verse 20, chapter 1. But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home empty again. Why do you call, my, call me Naomi, since he has testified against me? The Almighty has afflicted me. Now again, read 20 again now of here. What a difference. 20 and 20. Verse 20 on one, verse 20 on the other. Look. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours. He's one of our close relatives. Now you understand the Levite, the reason I explained to you the Levite marriage. All of a sudden, Naomi said, There is hope for us. I might yet be a grandmother. There is hope for you, my daughter. Oh my. She's blown away. Just blown away. <sighs> might I add, 
on another, on the same level that we talked about before, and this is what makes this book so magical. When the weight of your own sin comes down upon your head, and you finally realize there's no escape. When I'm talking about some of my brothers here who have done crimes so atrocious, and they bury them. Some of, I'm talking about things like rape, abortion. I'm talking about when, when the sin falls upon you so bad, and you know even today you're involved in you think there's no rescue. Who shall rescue me? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There is nothing He can't forgive you of. Nothing. Nobody. There's only one sin that cannot be forgiven. And that's the sin of not acknowledging you have sin, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. If you will bring him your sin, he will forgive you. How awesome is that? No sin can be forgiven. No sin. Verse 23, uh, verse 21, here's where we close. Ruth the Moabitess said, He also said to me, You shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. Now it could be that Ruth is saying, well, maybe he's going to give me to one of his young men. Maybe I will have a, me a husband who will actually have a job, who works for a powerful man. And don't we do that to God? Don't we limit God? Don't we limit God? Well, maybe someday I'll have an apartment. What are you talking about? God's going to get you a house. Maybe someday I'll have a car that... Are you kidding me? God's plan for you. I love it. It was um, Jim Simbala who wrote Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. He said, God has a banquet. And he just says, pull up. You have not because you ask not. He, he says, here's my banquet. And you live on such meagerness that the crumbs that fall from others' tables and God has a banquet for you. Pull up and eat. Feast. You shall stay by my young man. Verse 22, And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, and the people, and that people do not meet you in, in any other field. Basically, you're safe. The first thing is safety. At least you're safe in this field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Now, let me explain to you what happens here real quick as we close. Understand this. This wasn't an overnight love affair. This wasn't love at first sight. Although something might have been kindled, you're dealing with a godly man. Now, from barley season to wheat season is about three months. So three months, every day, she went out and gleaned in the same field, awaiting. And when there was nothing left, she stayed home, but did not go into another field because that's what her mother-in-law says. Now, next week, I think it's a prayer meeting. But the following week, two weeks from today, you're going to see how a Jewish mother she knows how to set some stuff up here. <laughs> this Jewish mom, she knew how to make sure that things worked out exactly the way she planned. She didn't rush things. You just keep going back there. Well, maybe I'm going to marry one of his workers. You just, just do what I tell you to do. Where do you see the way she sets it up? It's absolutely glorious. And, and I think we're going to go through uh, verse, chapter 3 and 4 in two weeks. Yeah, we're going to do chapter 3 and 4, unless the Lord has other plans. But... Amazing love story, and it's all about us. Greatest thing in the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, your word of light, your word of life. God, we are like the apostles, and you told them these hard things. You must eat my body and drink my blood. And he said, do you, do you want to leave me also? 
and your apostles, dear Lord, said, where else can we go? For you have the words of life. Truly, there are no other words of life other than your words, God. May they sink deep into our heart. May they give hope. May the word Boaz give hope to the hurting. May this story fill those that need whatever they need with what they need. For your word tells us that you know what we need before we even ask. Thank you, God. Bless us, God, with an understanding of your word and your plan for our lives. For Christ's glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.